discussion of the Theotokos, we then go to the fourth Wednesday of Lent. This is the week of the adoration of the cross. And uh, this, of course, is held on the third Sunday of Lent. And this is the glory the, uh, for the pre-sanctified liturgy. Uh, and uh, I'll just discuss the, the, the first line of the hymn. Today the unapproachable by nature approaches me and frees me from passions by enduring the passion. The light of the blind is spat upon by sinful men and gives his back to scourgings for the sake of the captives. We are the captives. We are the captives of death, the captives of hate. So the structure and the theological logic of this first portion, of the first two lines, is a more general pattern that we see in the Orthodox Church. It's a lofty definition of divinity, the unapproachable God, the light of the blind. And then it is conjoined to an image on the Incarnation, the God who approaches humanity, the God who humbles himself and becomes vulnerable in the face of human evil. This is a paradox that lies at the very heart of Orthodox hymnography, as we know explicitly from the 15th Antiphon in Holy Thursday, Today is suspended on a tree, him who suspended the earth upon its waters. He who is the king of angels is arrayed in a crown of thorns. And in Christmas, at the ninth hour, today is born of a virgin, him who holds the whole creation in the hollow of his hand. He whom in essence none can touch is wrapped in swaddling clothes as a mortal. So this kind of, the way the narration goes and the way the hymnography goes is what we see many times within the Orthodox Church. Now, Psalm 45, 2 which the church reads in reference to Christ. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips, therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Is reworked in the verse of this hymn, Thou whose beauty was fairer than that of any man. And it is used for another contrast. The incomparable heavenly glory of the Son of God is now almost impossible to discern because Jesus is now seen as lifeless, with no form nor comeliness, as the hymn says. The lamentation of the Virgin in this hymn recalls to mind one of the hymns during the funeral service. It's by John the Monk, tone 8, I weep and I wail when I consider death and behold our beauty, fashioned according to the image of God. Lying in the graves, disfigured and bereft of glory, not having form. Oh, wonder, what is this mystery concerning us? How have we been given to corruption? How have we been wedded to death? If we think about this, if the mortality of man, created according to the image of God, is an incomprehensible tragedy, the mortality of man created in the image of God, how much more incomprehensible is the death of Christ, the image himself. The hymn takes us into the very heart of theology. The answer in the end of the hymn is God chooses the impossible, namely to be born and to die as a human out of compassion for us in order to destroy death and to teach us how to regain immortality. And again, it indicates the movement of the cycles of the services from Lent to resurrection when we sing of Christ destroying death by death. Now, in the hymn, and also in this icon, the reference to the virgin's heart being pierced by a sword sends us to the prophecy of Simeon, which was recorded in the Gospel according to Luke, where it says, Then Simeon, when he received Christ, Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. That was spoken to the Virgin Mary. She experiences much of the same pain that he experiences, just as bad, if not worse than death, looking upon her son who is now dead. She truly cannot bear to see him on the cross. And this is what this icon represents. Uh, the one is Christ with the crown of thorns, and, the, and you see the Virgin with the sword going through her heart. Going back to the prophecy of Simeon, this is what this icon represents. 
And if you look at the icon and listen to the words that we read on Holy Thursday, as you can hear the Theotokos' pain upon seeing her son walking to his death, having beheld her lamb being led to slaughter, Mary the ewe followed him in the company of other women, troubled and crying thus, Where goest thou, my son, and why hastenest thou to finish this course? Is there perchance another wedding in Cana, to which thou hastenest to change the water into wine? Shall I go with thee, or shall I rather tarry? Give me, O oh word, give me, give me word, O oh word, nor pass me in silence. O oh, thou who didst keep me undefiled, for thou art still my son and my God. So you can hear the Theotokos' cry of grief, and you can see, understand why a sword, the metaphorical sword, is piercing her heart. That's the way she feels. She feels as if she is being stabbed. The, the hymn... Uh, notice when the hymn, woe is me, woe is me, it goes high because she is wailing. Woe is me, when I see thy face, it's, uh, it doesn't bear the representation that I saw before. Woe is me, oh my light, when it goes up the second time, oh my light, it ascends very high because she still is, is just, this is incomprehensible to her. Why is this happening? And then listen carefully and remember the icon, that's why they're there. When we get to the uh, line that says, my heart by a sword is pierced, where you see that the hymnology, that the music reflects the words that are being chanted.
restored his spirit, there was a definite and abrupt break within the hymn to represent her heart as being pierced by the sword.